Welcome back. Well, now we bring you our CDT and Africa series on food production on the continent. Here's Lindy Muntangana with the third installment on farming technologies and innovation. We continue with our series, Food Production in Africa. There are few sectors in Africa's regional economy that have not been touched by the ongoing technological revolution on the continent. Agriculture is no exception, and new innovations are bringing more and more young people back to the land. As you can probably tell by the machinery surrounding me, today's installment is all about tech in farming. Now, as farming becomes more appealing to the continent's youth, more entrepreneurs are looking into getting into agribusiness. But this generation is doing things rather differently. I met with an aquaponics farmer in Nairobi, Kenya, who relies on fish to grow his crops. Let's take a look. Martino Kitio is a successful farmer, but you won't see him tilling the land under the blazing sun. Instead, he starts the day by feeding fish, and Martino is not concerned with fattening up these tilapia. It's their waste he's after, an essential element to this aquaponic farm. So aquaponics is a farming technique that uses aquaculture and hydroponics to basically grow vegetables. It uses the aquaculture component of raising fish in a closed roof system, and hydroponics, which is the growing of plants, of, um, plants and vegetables without the use of soil. Katio is among an emerging group of African agripreneurs who are introducing new innovations like aquaponics to the age-old sector of farming. Katio's Motiro Farms is situated on a two-acre plot in Nairobi, Kenya, and focuses primarily on growing lettuce. One of the key advantages of aquaponics is that this type of farming is not reliant on soil. We can basically grow vegetables where we don't actually have arable soil, so be it on sand, be it where the soil is, is spoiled by chemical runoffs or where there's maybe a rocky environment or where the soil itself is not suitable for growing certain, certain crops that would not, would not grow well in that soil. Combined with the fact that aquaponics uses 98% less water than traditional farming and requires significantly less labor, this method can produce better crop yields. All the water they need, all the nutrients they need, everything they need is injected directly into now the roots. What that means is that the aquaponic plant's roots are not as big and as large as those in soil. And, 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 what's, and why is that important to the aquaponic plants? Is Because now the plants, instead of spending their time growing downwards, looking for nutrients, looking for water, that same energy that they spend now looking for, them, for the nutrients is what they spend growing upward. So what that means is that the aquaponic plant would grow in almost 50 to 60 percent faster. Although aquaponics requires significant capital investment, this type of farming could be crucial to Africa's food security, particularly as the effects of climate change begin to threaten traditional forms of agriculture. And as the global appetite for organic foods increases, Martino is already developing a long list of loyal clients, from online shoppers to grocery chains and restaurants. Hi, Chef Morio. How are you? What are you making today? Their products are healthy, fresh, and uh, since it is just one, uh, one mile away from us, we get it directly from them. Within less than 20 minutes, it's here, and it's uh, directly from the farm to the fork. From fish tank to table, aquaponics is bringing fresh organic food to homes and restaurants across Nairobi. Using less water, land and labor than traditional farming, this may well be the future of sustainable agriculture. In Kenya, an integrated mobile platform is revolutionizing how farmers work. Digifarm offers farmers access to a whole suite of products, including financial and credit services, quality farm products, and customized information on farming best practices. In this way, the platform is helping agribusiness and smallholder farmers to transact with more ease as they access crucial agricultural information at any moment from any way. Well, Kirsten Nyabwa has more. Agriculture is a key to Kenya's economy. The sector employs more than 40% of the total population and more than 70% of Kenya's rural people. 
but streamlining the industry is a massive undertaking that needs more than just one actor. We set off from Kenya's capital, Nairobi, headed to Chuka, a small town about three hours away, to talk to one such food producer. There we found Nancy Mudoni on her one-acre farm, preparing her maize seeds for planting. The pink paste she mixed her seeds in would keep pests away. Fifteen years since she went into farming, this is one of the methods she has recently learned to apply to improve her yield. She learned these techniques from a new platform that she and nine other farmers from the group she leads are signed up on. Last year we were introduced to Digifarm from Safaricom and we were told they wanted to work with farmers to give us loans and help us improve our yield. I accepted the offer and started to work with them. Digifarm is a mobile phone platform created by Kenya's biggest telecommunications operator, Safaricom. The platform enables smallholder farmers to bypass middlemen, giving them direct access to local seeds, farming information, and even markets for their produce. The rise of digital farming means farmers are now able to plant their crops, harvest, and sell their produce, while coming into very little physical contact with the field officers who continue to advise them. Many platforms continue to come up to encourage this change so that more people can go into farming. It's true that technology has been helpful to us because even when we have a problem, we call and they tell us to use this treatment. I'm also signed up to another service called Twigger that markets my bananas. They call to ask if the bananas are ready, if they can harvest them. We can find solutions to problems even though we are far away from each other. These are some of the processes that Digifarm sought to streamline when it launched its operations. I spoke to Fred Keel, Digifarm's general manager, about the platform's vision. So really the question that we wanted to understand is why the small-scale farmers remained small and poor over the years. And we found a couple of issues. One, uh, most of the farmers are planting things or they are farming things they should not be farming where they are located because of lack of knowledge, right? And the second issue that we found is most of the farmers never use certified inputs. The solution he found was to make information and resources available even to farmers in the most remote areas in the country. We are fixing about three problems. Uh, the first one is around productivity. Uh, we've seen farmers are producing at 30 percent of their potential. The second issue we are trying to fix around post-harvest loss management where they are losing above 30 to 40 percent of their produce. And lastly, we're also fixing the issue of market uh, linkage. This season, Nancy hopes to harvest between 20 and 50 bags of maize. Technology is the accelerator that is bringing back profitability to agriculture, giving farmers a powerful incentive. And bringing more people to the farms to undertake successful farming could be the key to securing the future of Africa's food production. Wilkis Anyabwa, CGTN. Agriculture has been identified as an important industry, not only in addressing food security, but also unemployment in Africa. The continent has 60% of the world's arable land, which provides ample opportunity for the sector to thrive. However, there are still too many barriers to entry, especially for young people. Sumitra Naidu caught up with a young farmer in South Africa who's determined to make it. Guguletu Mshlango fell in love with farming as a child. It was only later on that she decided to take it on formally in university. It started off as pure passion until I got into the industry and I realized the many opportunities that are here. I realized that um, it's something that I can grow into, it's something that I can make a career of, and it's something that I can definitely be successful in. In total, we have 10 tunnels, we have 10 nets, they are all occupied. And these are some of the ladies that work with me as well. Behind me, they're currently reading. And um, further down there is where we are currently doing our land preparation for our green beans and our Hubbard squash and our baby marrow. So we're very excited about that. The struggle that I have is basically transport. 
and um, finding the right markets, finding the right prices for to sell to. And um, currently, you know, with this COVID-19 pandemic, we had produce and like um, no one to sell to. The spinach was frosting because of the winter. We just had so many challenges. So now, slowly but surely, we are picking up and um, I've managed to secure clients from the Joburg markets. This is the irrigation system that um, it's the sprinklers that we use currently. And um, yeah, we also need to look at getting micro jets because uh, we only have one water reservoir. And now that I'm expanding, I also need another reservoir to meet up with the water demands. Um, thankfully on the fields, we are busy with the drip irrigation system. That makes it perfect because it saves the water, the little water that we have. Funding and accessing finance are still big challenges for emerging farmers. I am looking at saving, I'm looking at investing, I'm looking at applying for loans, you know, but obviously as a startup, I need to show good cash projections and financial projections that I'm able to pay. More opportunities are becoming available, but farming remains expensive because it needs resources and is labor intensive. You know, I feel like um, government needs to expose young younger people to agriculture and make it more um, easier for them to access funding, to access support. Having extra skills has proved beneficial for Mshlangu. If you want to start agriculture and it's your passion, you need to know that it is a business, you know, and you need to be able to capitalize on your skills. Gugu is just 27 years old and she's already been farming for about three or four years. She is really passionate, but funding is a huge challenge, especially in South Africa. The plan is to eventually buy her own piece of land to farm. Because my lease is for five years. So in the next five years, I'm going to actually own my own farm and I'm going to be looking at modern ways of agriculture because I'm young. You know, I've realized that there are faster ways to do this and there's cooler ways to do it like hydroponics and um, it's been interesting it's been exciting it's been challenging and it's been a growing learning curve for me so it's, it's an absolutely exciting journey In today's Expert Perspective segment, we're joined by Professor John Wesonga, an Associate Professor of Horticulture and Food Security at the Joma Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology in Kenya. Professor, thank you so much for joining us. Now, Africa is home to the majority of the world's uncultivated arable land, while at the same time, Africa is home to the world's youngest population, many of whom are unemployed. Why is it that this youthful African population isn't gravitating towards agriculture? Parents, guardians, who perhaps uh, would like them to get into other profession other than agriculture. Many of the youth do not have land and uh, they cannot access land. Uh, we are aware that uh, most of the older generation are not willing to let land go so that the youth can actually uh, practice agriculture. Mm -hmm. Usually they would also not have the means, the financial means perhaps to lease land or something like that. They do not have capital to acquire equipment which they may need to practice agriculture. Mm -hmm. Then there is the whole question of market. Uh, I think agricultural produce, uh, getting market is one of the biggest challenge. Professor, you talked about barriers to entry and the challenge of getting one's produce to the market. What should African governments be doing to make it easier for young people to enter the agricultural sector? Key thing is uh, facilitate the, the youth. Uh, for those who perhaps are not very keen on, on getting into agriculture, I think one way is to give them the right information. Let them know that agriculture perhaps is not as laborious as, as, it, as, as it looks because uh, I think more often than not, there are many uh, aspects of agriculture that do, does not, uh, do not entail uh, cultivating, handling soil. So it's not really that, that as such. There should be mechanism to improve marketing so that they can easily access markets without uh, maybe brokers and uh, get a good price for the produce. So as you say, farming is no longer laborious. So, Professor, tell us about some of the changes or the trends you've seen in farming practices uh, over the past few decades. Of course, the immediate uh, new uh, uh, direction is moving away from rain-fed agriculture to irrigated agriculture. 
because uh, I think traditionally most of the farming has been rain fed. When it's not raining, you don't, you don't plant. Uh, I think I always uh, say that uh, you don't necessarily need rain to, to farm, you need water. Moving away from over-reliance on soil, we are now getting into non-soil uh, systems. Uh, for example, in horticulture, we use uh, a lot of uh, non-soil substrates like cocoa peat, which we use. We are also looking at protected cultivation so that instead of growing in the open field, we can use greenhouses or other structures that can be used then can protect the crops. We are, using, we are seeing integration of ICT into the farming so you can automate some of the processes. For example, where some of the things we are doing here at the university, we, can, we grow our tomatoes and uh, most of the irrigation is uh, semi-automated so you don't need to come and turn on the water. The, 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 the system automatically turns on the irrigation system. So those are some of the developments that are coming up and making farming a bit cool <laughs> for the young people. <laughs>After a devastating locust invasion and relentless floods in northern Kenya, farmers in the region are preparing for yet another planting season, hopeful there won't be a second swarm of locusts. Technology is taking center stage too, as scouts across the region are armed with apps to report any sightings of locusts. CGTN's Nick Mudimba has more from Garissa, Kenya. Kicked off our journey from Kenya's capital Nairobi to Garissa, 370 kilometers away. Upon arrival, we hit the road once again, 60 kilometers from Garissa town to a village called Balambala, where desert locusts wrecked havoc. The situation was unfortunate. The farm is 145 hectares and what remained after the invasion is an eyesore. We didn't know anything about locusts. We saw how destructive they were. They ate everything. We used to spray 20 times every day. They cleared three acres of sesame. Four acres of watermelon and lemon trees were all eaten. Just as you pass by, you meet these farmers getting rid of kills that went through double attack, locusts and diseases. Disposal is the order of the day as they ponder the next move. The facial expressions and body language is that of grief. They lost what was supposed to be a bumper harvest. As if the locust invasion was not enough, flooding was also a menace here. The farmers are right now picking up the pieces in readiness for another planting season. It's been a double tragedy, locusts and farming. But look at them, they're actually making it ready for another planting season. A very, very conspicuous virtue of hope in times of darkness. The loopholes and confusion that was witnessed when fighting the locust had an adverse impact on some farmers. The chemicals they used to spray were deadly to the human body. We were not aware of the pesticides. We had no protective wear. Right now some people can't see. Some people have developed back and neck complications. During my attendance to FAO training to journalists, I spoke to Williams Hamisi, Deputy County Representative FAO Kenya, about the current plans on the locust invasion. The locust that we got in December was not born and bred in Kenya. It came in. So something brought it here. This something is wind. So these are southerly winds, those that were blowing from the areas of Ethiopia uh, to our northern district frontier. And then this, the locusts spread with the wind now to the entire north, northern part of Kenya. So these winds, they have a pattern. Uh, like now, the pattern is that they are blowing north. So you don't expect uh, much of invasion now coming south because locusts will, will fly with the wind direction. Technology has been integral in fighting the locusts in different parts of Kenya. Just an app and the response is swift. Specifically, uh, for control purposes, uh, FAO has an app which we call eLocust 3M app, which is an app where every person involved in matters distant locust management, when they cite locust, they would be able to put uh, that information in the app, and immediately this is loaded 
it is um, uploaded to the headquarters where analysis is done. And then some predictions are generated. The fear of a second wave of the invasion is a possibility, but FAO's focus is to stabilize the farmers first. What we're looking at now is to support the farmers first, maybe th through various means. But one of them would be like cash transfers, uh, some conditional, some unconditional. FAO has kicked off talks with Yemen in fighting the desert locusts to avert the second wave of invasion that is likely to hit Kenya again. Nick Mudimba, CGTN. In today's Food Cultures in Africa segment, we sample Luwombo, a Ugandan staple dish. Hamida Namatovu prepares to cook Luwombo, a Ugandan traditional dish. She's gathered all the ingredients and her shopping list includes a variety of spices. These tomatoes, onions and green pepper add flavor. They also stimulate someone's appetite while eating the dish. Hamida roasts the chicken on top of banana peelings to give it a smoky taste. She roasts it until it's golden brown. And then mixes it with a spicy sauce. The dish is wrapped in a smoked banana leaf, locally known as impombo. The green banana leaves are medicinal. It's a healthy way of cooking food as opposed to those who use plastic wrappers. Hamida puts banana leaf stems at the base of the saucepan. This helps to raise the mpombos above the water that produces steam while cooking luombo. The food takes about two to three hours to cook. It is then served with mashed plantains, locally known as matoke. Luombo can be prepared with beef, chicken, goat, or granites, and cooking it in banana leaves is what gives this dish its unique taste and aroma. Food lovers here say it's a memorable experience. No, the food was very nice because I think they have prepared it well. They have given it a lot of uh, a, a lot of time I can say and when you're preparing something that you love it when you're preparing something that you know how how they go about it of course when it comes out it has to be very good I think that is the uniqueness that has been the food Luombo is traditionally a dish for Baganda people in central Uganda but because of its popularity it's being adopted in other parts of the country <laughs> Hilara Iska, CGT, Kampala, Uganda. Water, a key component for agricultural production. Join us tomorrow as we explore the continent's reliance on rain and some countries' shift to irrigation. Back to you. In